my name is John Pandolfino. I'm the president of the AMS, and it's really my pleasure tonight to uh, bring you the AMS virtual webinar on social media and medicine potential and pitfalls. Um, before we start, though, I definitely want to remind everyone that we're about 20 days out from the 2021 AMS annual meeting in Boston. Um, we're going to have a great uh, attendance at this meeting, um, and it'll be an opportunity to see old friends and learn new things. In addition, I want to remind everybody uh, that we still are open for applications for our Ironwood AMS Diversity Development Award, and you can find information on that on our website. Now, as many of you have seen from the title, this is a topic that is extremely important in medicine today, uh, social media, something that I wish I was much better at. And currently, uh, my social media accounts are managed by someone in my hospital. That's how bad I am at social media. So with that in mind, um, we obviously put together a star-studded panel of people who are essentially celebrities on social media um, in terms of the motility world. And, and our moderator tonight is probably one of the, the best people on social media in terms of GI and especially in the pediatric world. That's Dr. Peter Liu, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist and research director of the Motility Lab at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And he's also an assistant professor at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. In addition to his own personal and professional um, social media accounts, he's also very involved in managing Naspagan's uh, media account. And he also runs the Naspagan podcast, Bowel Sounds, the pediatric GI podcast. So without further delay, Dr. Peter Liu. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Panelfino, for that introduction. Uh, so as he said, welcome everyone to another ANMS webinar, this time on social media and medicine, its potential and pitfalls. Um, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Jen Webster as the moderators of today's webinar. And we have uh, two excellent talks today, one with practical advice for clinicians and scientists interested in using social media, and the other about one of the biggest challenges we face with regards to social media, so the spread of false health information. Uh, as a reminder, please enter questions into the Q&A box. Uh, after the two talks, Dr. Webster and I will take turns asking the questions to our panel of speakers and moderators. Our first talk will be by Dr. Walter Chan. So Dr. Chan is the director of the Center for GI Motility at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He currently serves as the social media editor for the American Journal of Gastroenterology. He's also the chair of the research committee for the Association of Healthcare Social Media, or AWESOME. In addition to his clinical and research work in neurogastroenterology motility, he's also interested in the use of social media in patient and medical education, professional development, and research. Dr. Chan, take it away. Uh, thank you for the uh, very nice introduction. Um, it's great to be here uh, talking about a little bit more about social media and how it's affecting us, how we can use social media in our day to day. Uh, I'm going to pull up um, my slide really quickly and uh, share my screen here. Uh, hopefully I can get this to work. So the, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit more on the practical side. How do we incorporate social media in healthcare and in, in research? And what do we need to know? What do we need to be mindful of? Just to start talking a little bit about social media. Um, a lot of people, I think, were hesitant when, uh, when, when social media became more popular, especially in the professional world. But you're actually likely already using some form of social media even before you start going on Twitter or some of the uh, newer um, uh, media sites. Uh, it's not really just the popular ones like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. There are actually a lot of other platforms as well, including YouTube, Yelp, uh, TikTok, you know, even Reddit and Wikipedia, which a lot of, uh, which is open to basically the public to, to enter information, all, also part of social media as well. And in terms of how often people use social media, this is a study, a survey looking at sort of an international survey asking uh, uh, the public uh, how often they use um, their mobile apps. 
and, and people use them on average four hours of uh, 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 mobile device each day. And of them, about 44% are spent on social media or communication apps. So people spend a lot of time on social media. And uh, what is the trend? Which are the popular ones? I think some of, that's one of the questions when we think about social media and which one to use. Uh, currently, this is a research uh, survey from the Pew Center from last year. Um, uh, the social media use is uh, the platform that's mo most popular among Americans seems to be YouTube and Facebook. The ones that we use very often uh, as healthcare professionals, such as Twitter and LinkedIn, are somewhere in the middle. So it's important to understand that and think about what platform to use, depending on what, what audience you want to target. And, and that's why it's actually important to know uh, what your audience is and how to match them with the different uh, social media platforms. And um, again, this is a, this is another uh, survey study from the Pew Center asking basically page, uh, the public uh, adults, US adults of different age group and what social media uh, site or what social media apps they're using. As you can see here, the main thing you can see here is that um, adults there in the older age groups tend to be much less likely to use some of the popular social media sites like Snapchat or TikTok or Twitter. But the ones that they use most often are actually Facebook. So if you want to target that audience, you have to think about which platform you want to focus on. Uh, this is the same data kind of put a different way, uh, uh, looking at different um, demographic background and, and how often they use different social media platforms. And you can see here, again, you know, the older age groups tend to be more likely to be on Facebook compared to something like Instagram or Twitter, which tend to be, tend to be uh, younger in terms of the, uh, uh, their audience. The other one you can notice is that uh, LinkedIn, which is more of a professional social media, tend to have more um, adults that, uh, that have, they're at a higher income level or are more educated. In terms of professional social media use, um, there's been an increase in recent years of professional using social media for work. This is a worldwide survey that was done, and it's shown that, especially in the younger generation, about 30 to 40 percent of people actually use social media for work. So it, it seems to be a trend that, that that's increasing, that more people are adopting professional social media, and we're definitely seeing that in healthcare. So before we start using uh, getting into social media for as a healthcare professional, what are some of the things that we need to think about? First of all, you need to think about what are your goals? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish with using this? And there are really three main things that you can really accomplish with social media, outreach, with connections, and also education. So what are some of the things you can do with outreach? Uh, amplifying or promoting some of the services that you offer, the work you've done, some of your achievements, either to patients or the public um, or to other professionals, your colleagues. You can also um, educate or disseminate medical information or your newest research, either to trainees, to other healthcare professionals, or, and also to the patients and the public. And finally, it's an important tool uh, as a connection tool that can help you link with individuals or group that share the same interests with you, whether they be potential collaborators, potential employers, um, key leaders in your field, or organization or institutions that share the same interests with you, so for example, like AMS. So what are some of the impact of social media and outreach that we know? Uh, this is actually a study that was published a couple of years ago looking at how, what's the association between social media involvement for an institution and their divisional ranking in GI on US news. And um, what we found was that the Twitter account, the official institutional Twitter account follower account uh, correlated with the best hospital GI ranking on US News and also the reputation score, meaning the higher, the more um, followers you get, the higher the ranking, the higher reputation score. And when we look at the change between two different years, we also found that changes in follow, Twitter follow account over two years also predict, predicted whether the, the ranking improved or maintained versus dropping in the ranking over the same period. Um, obviously, we're not trying to claim that there's a direct causation because we really don't know, but at least um, social media involvement and social media interaction, how many followers you have, may be a reflection of the reputation of the institution. What about education? Uh, this is another study where we did um, basically uh, surveying GI fellowship program directors between two years. And what we found was that 
kind of paralleling the increasing in, in, in popularity of using social media in healthcare, there's been a significantly increase in, in proportion of program directors who think that social media should be incorporated into training, who think that trainees should be encouraged and trained to use social media, um, that it should be considered a useful source of medical information for GI fellows. And more interestingly, even though still a low percentage, information that were obtained from social media has been used by some program director in the applicant ass assessment process. So really, we should really be careful and think about what we put on social media for personal or professional use. Uh, what about research? Um, this is a study that we just published um, uh, earlier this year looking at social media promotion and citation for publications. We look at five major GI journals and we found that uh, promotion on their official social media account um, correlated with the number of citations within three years for the publications. Um, and uh, this is actually, we actually divided um, the, uh, the, the publication types into the different areas. And motility is here, and as you can see here, a fairly decent proportion of them were actually tweeted. So I think overall, a lot of there's a lot of interest in a lot of the papers in motility or neurogastroenterology, um, and 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 they're among the most frequently promoted. As you can see, the percentage of red. And uh, the other thing we found was that articles they're tweeted and retweeted, meaning more interaction, also generated more citations. Not surprisingly. Um, and, and the ones that are more likely retweeted tend to be the reviews and meta-analyses, uh, which obviously a lot of times those are also the ones that are more, more likely cited. What about patients? We talk about education to professionals, to researchers. How about the patients? Um, this is a study that was uh, presented at DDW last year looking at the Twitter accounts of 16 IBD physicians and their posts. And what they found was that um, healthcare providers tend to engage more with other physician contents and patients are often likely to engage, but usually silently. They like to uh, like the tweets or retweet, but generally, oftentimes they don't generate their own content. And the type of content tends to be promoted or shared by patients tend to be either research themes or want to tweet about or promote new research, um, disease management and diagnosis, or anything on preventative care. So, you know, even though patients are not, maybe not the most vocal, maybe they're not tweeting all the time, they're definitely part of the audience and like to interact with what we put out as professionals. So I've been talking about the impact of social media and what we could accomplish in terms of the goals. How do we get started? So um, when you think about getting started with social media, the first thing you need to think about is really getting into the mindset of a marketing, communication, and public relations mindset. And by, and, 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 and by that, you need to think about how you can amplify and promote certain things either that you're doing or ideas you have or events that you have. And, and one of the first thing you should really do is set your goal. Like, what are you trying to accomplish in terms of what we talked about? Are you trying to mainly try to amplify what you do? Are you mainly trying to make connections? Are you mainly trying to do education? And the other thing is branding. Uh, that's important. Um, how, how do you brand yourself on social media? Um, and that really tying with what kind of goals you have as well. So if you want to, um, mainly you want to uh, serve as an educator and promote uh, health information to the public, then you might more likely brand yourself as a medical educator or a public health educator. Um, and, and setting that and putting that all together is important. Identifying your audience. We talked about different platform and have different audience um, and, and different engagement of different uh, populations. So identifying your target audience is important so that you can choose the right platform. Uh, one other thing before you get started that's important is to know your institution and department policies. A lot of institutions already have social media policies in place and you want to make sure that um, you are not uh, <clears throat> running against or, or breaking any of the rules that are set up by them. Uh, it is not, uh, it is often good, especially if you're starting a, an account, let's say for your division or for your own group, to notify the, the PR office, uh, the communication office of your institution so that they can give you more guidance as well if there's if there's any specific limitations or guidelines in your institution 
engage uh, in uh, social engagement, engaging with other uh, 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 users um, and your and your and your uh, colleagues. And also, find role models. Uh, you know, if you identify with someone who shares the same interests, who are active on social media, you know, find those role models and colleagues and and communicate with them. And that might be useful in helping you get started. When we talk about the first thing you talked about was goal setting. What is what are some of the potential goals for healthcare professional in using social media? And there are really two different categories. You know, the personal development side, which I think are obvious. You know, staying ahead uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of the uh, news in your field, the journals, the society news, uh, engaging in professional discussion. Uh, networking with your peers we talked about, those are important goals. There are also some other ones, you know, uh, marketing, uh, promote what you do, uh, boosting the institution uh, or department reputation, just like the study where we talked about. Uh, also humanizing the profession. Uh, a lot of times uh, people like to put a human side to uh, healthcare, to physicians, uh, uh, physicians, physicians' life. And I think sometimes that's important too, to kind of help you empathize with, with your patients. But one, one of the ones I specifically want to point out that uh, for some people, um, um, it's one of the goals that they have in engaging social media is combating some of the physician rating sites. And I think a lot of us um, uh, know about a lot of these sites out there uh, where it is open to the public. Anyone can go on there and write comments and put ratings. And obviously those sites are very biased, right? Because usually you know, there could be one or two disgrunt disgruntled individuals and can write lots of comments and ratings on there. And oftentimes they're not very accurate. And one of the ways that you can really take back the narrative is really get on some of these online platforms, social media platforms. And a lot of times once you get on social media, one, you can control your message. And two, a lot of times they show up sooner on search engines. So someone, when they search for you, your, your social media um, accounts often come up first and it really help you kind of take back the narrative uh, com compared to these rating sites. Uh, what about branding? Uh, we talk about branding being important. How do we set up uh, a social media account uh, and, and brand it appropriately to help you achieve your goal? Uh, first of all, you know, this is some examples of some of my accounts that I use. Your profile should really clearly convey your professional background, your mission and your interests. What, what are you interested in? What are your goals? Um, when you set your profile name, generally use your professional name, maybe including your primary degrees or qualifications to allow patients to identify you. Choose, when you choose a handle for your social media platform, often the best one to use will be either your full name or maybe your professional interest, something tied into your profession, but mainly stay professional. Uh, cute inside joke type handle really should be safe for a more personal account rather than your professional account. Um, often include, include a brief bio sketch. You know, the primary information you want to include is your current role, what your institution is, and what your clinical or academic interests. If you have space, some of the secondary information you can include are your academic background, your personal background, maybe some of your personal interests, but really be careful of the character limits. Sometimes, for example, Twitter or Instagram have pretty small character limit that allow you to put in this bio sketch information. And then include a professional profile picture. And sometimes you may also be able to include a background photo that may help further showcase your professional brand as well. Uh, also, if, you, if, if, if it's allowed, put a link to your professional website. If there's a website uh, for you, your, pro, uh, your professional profile through your institution, put that website on your, on your uh, bio sketch area. We talk about choosing the right platform. So what are some of the platform to use? Um, and these are some of the common platforms that are used and, and sort of a summary of the purpose, the audience, and some of the characteristics. So Twitter tend to currently have more academic discussion, but the main thing is it has a pretty small character limit. Instagram tend to have a younger audience. Um, useful uh, main audience will be the public or the patients. And generally, uh, you, when you use Instagram, you aim to have to put on either photos or videos. Facebook have more patients and an older audience, but it's really good for marketing. Marketing. LinkedIn tend to be mostly professionals. YouTube and TikTok uh, tend to be useful for education or creative expression because they're mostly video based. Uh, YouTube has a very wide audience and TikTok tends to be for younger individuals. And Reddit is mainly for uh, online discussions and has very uh, high character limits. 
And when you engage in social media, what are the steps when you start getting engaged in social media? And this is actually, I took this from uh, one of the papers was published in the Red Journal last year and talk about, they call this taxonomy of tweeting, which is, you know, how do you get more and more engaged? You know, when you get first get started, start basically liking or sharing or retweeting some of the other people's content. So you don't have to think so much about creating your own yet when you're just getting used to social media. Be careful to use credible sources, you know, maybe accounts of your colleagues, your institutions, some of the official organizations or journals. And then once you get comfortable, the second thing you can do is start, start sharing or retweeting with adding your own comments. So add your own summary or your opinions to these content. May, may, you may also start to reply to other people's posts. And then finally, once you get comfortable, then you can start creating your own content. In terms of creating your own contents, um, the, the, uh, what, you, what the type of things you want to do really depend on your interests, your goals and missions and your target audience. Some of the things you can put on your content, your achievement, either your own or other people that you're trying to promote. Uh, the newest medical research news may be with your commentary as well. Uh, educational contents, maybe summary of journal articles, clinical guidelines, some chosen topics. Uh, maybe promote events or research or clinical trials that you're running that you're trying to recruit patients. Consider live tweeting or tweeting content from conferences or other professional events that you're at. Um, there are also a lot of times call to action for certain health promotion, like colon cancer awareness month, that you can start tweeting contents about that. Um, maybe elements of daily, uh, uh, of your daily life, you know, either, uh, you know, your work life, but be very careful about what you post on there, which we'll talk about in a second. Once you set it up, the next thing to, to decide is who are the, what accounts should you follow to get started? You know, easiest one, the first one, professional organization to share the same interests, follow their account. Um, journals uh, are, are useful uh, because then you can get all the newest information. Uh, maybe colleagues, collaborators, thought leaders in your field are useful uh, following them and maybe start engaging in discussions with them. And also patient organizations as well. These are some of the good uh, accounts to start following. You know, there'll be reliable information you can get. You can also get engaged in online chats through the social media platform. On Twitter, there's been a lot that's been going on. Some of the common ones, you know, IBD has a very big event that's set up. GI Journal Club that's happening every week now where they discuss a chosen article every week. Uh, Scoping Sundays, it's mainly endoscopy based. There are a few, there's a little bit, there are motility and neurogastro based as well. There's Tuesday night IBS where uh, it's, I think, once a month discussing certain aspects or cases in IBS. Uh, one of the things that I started a few years ago, uh, I call it Tracing Tuesday. I was posting uh, motility tracing uh, on some Tuesdays and, and to generate discussions. So um, uh, I, I don't have a specific account for it, but there's a hashtag that I usually use where you can really easily search for older tracings and some discussions. And obviously, if anyone's just interested in joining me on that, I would love to have more people participate in that as well. We talk about all the benefits of the social media, but what are some of the, some of the potential pitfalls that we need to be careful about? First of all, patient privacy and HIPAA concerns, it's important. Uh, you need to avoid giving individualized medical advice um, uh, for often for legal reasons. Uh, be careful of sponsored contents and conflict of interest issues. Uh, professionalism concerns. Um, there have been some examples of people posting things that are not considered uh, professionals and get into trouble. Uh, misinformation that I think the next talk is going to discuss a little bit more about. Be careful of psychological strain and time commitment. Um, you know, a lot of times people will start spend, spending so much time on social media and getting even more stressed out when you see what other people are posting. And then finally, personal safety and well-being, especially given so many things out there now, especially with misinformation and some of the contentious topics. Uh, safety is important and be careful of that. We talk about some of the most important things, patient privacy. So I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time on that uh, because there was a study that was published in a Red Journal this last year looking at patient privacy. They look at 86 uh, gastroenterologists or surgeons account and over 900 tweets that contain, contain endoscopic images or videos. And what they found was that almost a third of the users post at least one tweet that, that you can categorize as being at risk of confidentiality and non-compliance. And um, 
ultimately uh, about 18% of them of the total tweets were at risk. Now, very few of them actually show things like the patient's phase of date of birth, which are obviously in violation. The vast majority of them are at risk for non-compliance really because of the mentioning of the procedure date. So there are actually information that are outside of the obvious ones, like the patient's name and face and, and identifiable information. They're also part of HIPAA that you need to be worried about. And really only one of these at-risk twists out of over 170 actually stated the patient consent was obtained. So what should we, how should we approach this in terms of patient privacy? Just remember that HIPAA violation, uh, you, you're violating HIPAA if the patient or someone connected to the patient can figure out that the person you're being described in your post is that patient. So um, uh, there's currently uh, 18 protected health information identifiers. These are mainly for research purposes, but I think the same rules apply as well to social media uh, that are really protected by HIPAA. And the, the ones, the two that are most often violated by people using social media are actually geographic location and date. Um, uh, oftentimes patients like, uh, a lot of people like to, when you get very excited, oh, today I did this cool procedure on this, uh, on this patient. Or I, uh, and that oftentimes uh, uh, it's considered a violation of HIPAA because the patient who got the procedure might know that you're actually talking about them or someone who know the patient. And uh, same thing with geographic location because by your uh, profile, people can figure out where you're located, what hospital you work for. And some ways to protect uh, these uh, 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 PHI on social media, some of the things you can do, avoid referencing to the date of the patient encounter, try to keep it vague, maybe alter some clinical history and detail of the post. Try, uh, one thing I'd like to uh, uh, allude to is maybe describe the case like a case vignette or a case report. Try to uh, describe it like you're not the person involved. Uh, obtaining and declaring patient consent might be useful. Uh, uh, um, know what your institution consent form cover. Um, Carefully inspect all the images before you post them, because a lot of times, you, especially if you take an endoscopic image, sometimes there will be a date of birth, a patient name that might be on the corner by default, that you need to make sure that you take them all away. Uh, conflict of interest is important. The same study looked at potential conflict of interest, and they found that uh, you know, a lot of the tweets actually mentioned name and brand of a device uh, without disclosing any financial relationship, even though they identify some of these posters who have had uh, received payments from those manufacturers. So the, the key to think about this is you need to disclose any financial, financial relationship with business entities that are connected to what you're posting. Basically, apply the same rule as you are giving a lecture or with your publications. Uh, how to disclose is still a little bit debated. Do you need to disclose every time you post something or can you just put something generic in your, in your profile with that work? I think there's still a lot of debate on that, but the key is to, to do some disclosure with your financial relationship. And lastly, um, the uh, research considerations and a couple things about uh, for researchers. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot now on social media is doing so visual abstracts. One of my job as the social media editor for the Red Journal is create these visual abstracts for the study you're publishing. Uh, these are useful to use in social media and help promote your work. Some of the keys in doing this is you want to use this to summarize your main study design and findings in a visual format. So uh, minimize details of some of the secondary details or results of basically focus on your main results, main findings. Uh, emphasize the main conclusions and clinical implications. Minimize using text and sentences, use more icons so they'll be more eye-catching and maybe use different color and sectioning to make the study design a little bit easier to visualize. And some of the other uh, research consideration that you think about is copyrights and publication embargo. Um, in, in particular, this, uh, this can apply to both publications and meetings. Uh, uh, be aware of some of the potential publication uh, copyright issue. Maybe also mindful of photo policies when you go to meetings and respect um, the preferences of the authors. My last slide, uh, some of the last tips to avoid some of the pitfalls that we talk about. Uh, these are some of the things you should really not post, you know, hypovalidic information, individual medical advice. We talk about patient shaming and a judgmental posts about patients, uh, content that may interview with patient care. Uh, if people 
reply to you, uh, avoid inflammatory rebuttals. The best way to avoid uh, getting a confrontation is you know, when you have comments from trolls, just ignore it, don't reply to them. Uh, do not uh, post about workplace conflicts, misgivings, or gossip. This is not the place for it. Um, avoid promoting specific business without uh, conflict interest disclosure. Be mindful of who you follow and what posts you like or interact with, because who you follow, what posts you like, is actually very easily visible to people that follow you. So if you don't, you don't want to start following or liking some posts that you don't want your patients or your colleagues to see. Um, be careful when you're approached for collaboration, because there are a lot of businesses out there that try to try to approach key opinion leaders for collaboration. And finally, when you want to post something, sit or when you type it out, sit on it, reread it, maybe even get other people to read to read it before you hit post, uh, so that you can uh, be careful to avoid some of the pitfalls that we talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan. I am here to introduce Dr. Van Tilburg. She is a professor of clinical research at Campbell University and an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina and an affiliate associate professor of social work at the University of Washington. She's an internationally renowned researcher in the areas of GI motility disorders, pediatric GI and behavioral sciences. She has dedicated her career to studying family factors, trauma and treatment for children with chronic pain. Pertinent to today's talks, she is verified on Twitter with over 17,000 followers and shares news on pediatric health, parenting, chronic pain, and gut health. Um, just as an aside, Dr. Van Tilburg's lecture was pre-recorded due to connectivity issues, but she is here live for the panel and will be able to answer questions. So please enjoy Dr. Van Tilburg's talk. Well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I am going to talk to you about false health information, how it spreads on social media and what we can do about it. So my learning objectives are um, to talk about what is false health information? Why do people believe in it? Um, what is the role of social media and how we can stop it? And hopefully I'll convince you to please join the fight in combating it. So let's first talk a little bit about what false health information is and why people actually are sharing it. Why, why would we even have false health information? Well, first of all, there's, sort of, there's, there's a category of misinformation. It's your mom telling you when you were a kid that you needed to wear a jacket if you go outside because otherwise you would catch a cold. It's genuine, but it's misguided and really it's supposed to be helping you. So there's no intent for harm. Um, lots of social media, uh, people on social media sharing false information are in this category. Then there's disinformation. These are usually people or companies who try to make money from selling a product. I think, for example, about Gwyneth Paltrow and um, her company and how she's trying to sell coffee enemas or things like that. These um, people generally uh, ignore any harm that comes with the products, but also with the, ignore the harm that comes with sharing uh, false health information. And then the last category, probably a little bit more concerning, is what is called fake news. This is usually shared by politicians or other who want to wield political power. So think about certain politicians inside the United States, but outside as well. We've heard about, for example, some Russian accounts trying to sort of sow discord in the US or European um, society. And there's definitely an intent for harm um, with this one. Although the intent of harm is only with fake news, all three of them are uh, harmful in the long term because it, it takes into question the knowledge that we have and the credibility of the people that are sharing it. So is false health information uh, something new? No, um, uh, false health information probably existed as long as medicines existed. Um, one category of false health information often is uh, focused on vaccines and vaccine hesitancy and concerns about vaccines. And um, that is very old as well. Vaccines were introduced in the 17th century by slaves who introduced uh, smallpox inoculation to white Americans. 
Not a lot of white Americans were really open to doing this in the medical profession either, um, probably largely driven by racism. But in 1796, Dr. Jenner invents the first smallpox vaccine based on cowpox, and um, that led to a lot of uh, vaccine hesitancy as well. So you can see that this picture behind the words is Dr. Jenner inoculating a woman, and behind her are all kinds of people who have already been vaccinated and are, are growing cow parts out of their body. So fighting against false health information is also not something particularly new um, or associated with social media. One really famous example is Roald Dahl, whose um, oldest doc daughter, Olivia, died of measles and syphilitis. This was well before a measles vaccine was available. And he wrote a very famous essay trying to make people to accept the measles vaccine when it came on the market saying that his daughter would really be happy if she knew that her death had helped other people. Now that we know we have false health information, why do people believe false health information? For this, I'm going to use the basic law of rumor. How does a rumor spread? Because false health information, how it spreads is very similar to how a rumor spreads. And a rumor basically has to have two ingredients. Uh, first of all, it needs to be an important subject to you. And then um, there needs to be some ambiguity of the evidence. Let me talk about the importance of the subject first. Of course, our health is very important to us. There's, there's no doubt, right? We, we, we pay attention to health information. But the way that that information is presented may make it even more important and salient to us than if you present it in another way. So when we share healthcare providers, usually, and scientists share health information, we usually focus appeal to the logic part of our brain, and we tend to share a lot of facts. That's very kind of cold, and we know from education research that that's not the way that people remember things. The way that people you really learn and you remember things is by if you can have those facts and that logic somehow tied with an emotion. So false health information does that really, really well. It ties information, new health information um, to an emotion and usually to negative emotions. We are far more likely to remember negative emotions than positive emotions. So saying, hey, a vaccine can save your life isn't as easily remembered as a vaccine is um, something that can risk your health. So a lot of negative emotions like distrust and disgust are invoked with false health informations. And then what false health information does is it relies on anecdotes. And as people we used to be before we had books and movies and TV and social media, we were people, we were sharing information through uh, stories. And so these anecdotes are stories and they help with remembering this information. It appeals to who we are as a human. And then the repetition of that information just makes it stick. Now to the other side of the law of rumor, there's the ambiguity of the evidence. So um, do we know what is true? Do you already know what's true, yes or no? Um, and who is sharing this? The credibility of the source plays a really important part in that. How credible is that source? Where it used to be that maybe people would believe uh, government officials and the doctor, nowadays that becomes less and less clear that those are the people you should be trusting in. We have the rise of expert patients, expert moms, expert celebrity who have done, quote unquote, their research. We also have a lot of people hiding as pseudoscientists. And so they, they put sort of this air of scientific uh, research scientific language on the information they spread. And that becomes really hard for people to know that that actually isn't science. But most important probably is that the credibility of the evidence is strongly influenced by what we already believe. So if I believe that chocolate is the best thing on earth and I see a study that says that chocolate protects my heart, I will want to believe that information. More chocolate for me. But if another study tells me that chocolate could increase my chances of cancer, I might be very skeptical of that information. So really, we see and hear what we believe. We do not really believe what we see and hear. And that's a problem in uh, false health information. 
In addition, science is sort of a credibility problem in and of itself. We don't really deal in known facts. We deal in the best evidence we have currently, and that evidence can change, because the interpretation of evidence can change over time. We really we, we deal in what we know is not true, rejecting the null hypothesis. We don't deal in what we know is true an absolute truth. And that's really hard for people to understand. So if we at the beginning of the pandemic told people, please don't wear a mask, and then later with new evidence, we tell them, please always wear a mask. That is very confusing to people outside of our field who say, hey, make up your minds. Why are you wrong? And even if people say, I really believe um, doctors because they are and scientists because they know this, they've studied it, even then we might have a problem. There are certainly doctors and scientists who share false health information themselves. So um, all of you probably have heard from American Frontline Doctors, which is a foundation that has shared a lot of uh, false health information around COVID-19. These are people in white coats. These are people that, you know, outside of our field, people believe. We know there are issues with um, this group. You know, none of them were really involved in the COVID-19 response or the science. Um, two were investigated by a medical board. Somebody was already retired. You know, all of that kind of stuff makes us doubt our credibility. But how does somebody outside of medicine know that? And then lastly, who really decides what healthy living means? Um, in the United States particularly, we have this individual freedom. We want to decide for ourselves what it means to be healthy. We don't want somebody else to prescribe that to us. And then in addition, really, medicine has had many, many problems. We're patriarchal and racist in a lot of ways. At least we still are, but our history is horrendous. And then we've done unethical research, unethical medical practices. We have prescribed dangerous drugs, etc. No wonder people are uh, doubting our credibility. And then that all of that combined with an underlying interest in natural and healthy living is sort of makes this creates this void. And there's a lot of people who want to just fill that void and have no problem doing that. Now, before I get off of this, I want to show you that health information, uh, false health information actually is harmful. I know that I probably don't have to convince you, but data is a good thing. So here's just one study. There are multiple ones. This is um, a study out of Italy after a judge decided, had a ruling that the measles uh, vaccine was associated with autism. You can see that vaccination rates dropped in children, not just for the MMR vaccine, but for all childhood vaccinations. So false health information is very harmful. Let's talk about the role of social media in all of this. We're all on social media all the time, right? YouTube, 1.5 billion you know, people on YouTube, but we're we just, we are on our phones, we're on our computers all the time, we check it all the time, we get pinged all the time. Well, it used to be before, if your Aunt Ned or, or uh, your Uncle Ned or Aunt Ida said, I don't believe in this, or I you know, some kind of false information, they could only talk to so many people. It wasn't very likely they would be on TV or they would be uh, cited in the newspaper. But now Uncle Ned can keep on creating as many videos as he wants and put it on YouTube or Instagram and spread it with millions of people potentially. So um, YouTube, for example, 25% of the videos um, about COVID-19 has been incorrect, but it reaches millions of people. And even though YouTube tries to remove these videos, it's a game of whack-a-mole. Just as many will pop up as you remove. And then in addition, the algorithm has been found to actually recommend the videos with false health information. So we truly have a problem with social media in spreading and propagating false health information. In addition, we're in what the World Health Organization has called an infodemic. We're just bombarded with information all the time. Your phone pings all the time. And we can't take in all that information. We can't really engage with it all the time. We can't really check if it's credible all the time. And that's a problem. In almost half of uh, people in the UK, the US and Canada have said that they've been exposed to fake news during the pandemic. I think that's an underestimate. 
And probably all of us have been exposed to fake news, but it shows you how hard it is sometimes to realize that you've been exposed to it um, when you're in that mix and in that infodemic. And then we know that fake news is believed. This is just one example, but about a third of Americans agree that Bill Gates used COVID-90 vaccine to implant microchips. We also know from studies that um, information overload reduces the spread of quality information online. So it definitely plays a big role. When you look at information online, you compare false information to other types of information. False information spreads faster, further, deeper, and more broadly. So some figures, and there are a lot of them, but falsehoods are 70% more likely to be reposted and they reach 1,500 people six times faster. So not only do we have a lot of false information on social media, it also spreads a lot further. Now, who shares all this inf false information, right? Where does that all come from? There's actually a very small amount of people who orig originate false information. So um, in a study on Twitter, only 0.1% of um, the accounts share 80% of the fake news. The Center for Countering Digital Hate has recently identified that disinformation doesn't. These are 12 people with a really large following whose accounts have not yet, hopefully, um, been removed from social media who share anti-vaccine misinformation. And then um, up to a third of the false information on Twitter is actually shared by bots. And I wanna talk a little bit about the role of bots. So, what do bots do? Are they the originators of, of uh, false health information? Well, here's how bots play a role in social media. Bots, first of all, because they're constantly being deleted, because they're monitored and being deleted by social media companies, they're kind of new and they don't have a lot of followers and they look a little strange. But what they do is they follow just a couple of account, accounts, very legitimate accounts, like scientists or uh, government agencies, such as the CDC. And then when, for example, the CDC says, wear your mask, the bot will, will put some kind of misinformation with that and saying, really, CDC, should I be wearing a mask? Because mask increases the chances I get COVID-19. Now, since the bots don't have a lot of reach, what the bots very smartly do is they will tag people with, who are influential and credible. So for example, I my Twitter account reaches about a million and a half to two million accounts uh, per month. So they might tag me, I'm in the infodemic, I'm distracted and I go, ooh, wow, really masks uh, increase your risk of COVID-19? Retweet real quickly. And maybe later I'll go, oh, that was dumb and I'll delete it, but the damage is done by then. So when I retweet it, that, post then gets um, credibility because people go like, well, Miranda's in the health field and she is a scientist and she knows about this stuff. So then more people of my followers start reposting this information. And that's how you have an increased reach. So bots really make sure that that false health information gets shared more easily. Let's switch to how we change someone's false beliefs. And I'll focus mostly on social media in here, not what you do in your office when you sit down with a patient. So we really need a coordinated response to false health um, information. And so the social media companies are already playing a big role. They probably can do an even better job, but they're already doing uh, quite some things. For example, a couple of years ago, if you would Google vaccines, you would get through pages and pages of suggested suggestions for false information before you would finally get to the right, the correct or right information. Um, the algorithms have changed. Uh, social media companies are removing people um, and accounts and groups, etc. They're warning us to please read articles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So quite something is already happening there. Of course, everybody on social media should be involved. We need to really critically think about what we're seeing, making sure that we don't just share, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a really big role for advocates who are people like you and me who are in the healthcare field. We are play a really important role in the response to false health information. 
So what can you do when you're on social media and you see somebody spreading false health information? Well, our first reaction is to just debunk it, tell people it's not true. Actually, there is no relationship between the measles, the MMR vaccine and um, autism. That is problematic in a lot of ways. First of all, by doing that over and over, you actually get people to deepen their beliefs. You almost make them defensive and get into a corner and it makes it harder for them to get out of it. Um, you might be seen as having a credibility problem. You, you're this kind of like CNN fake news idea. In addition, it's reactive instead of proactive. We're really allowing people who share false information to set the agenda. We're just debating them. We're, we're not setting the agenda on, on what the correct health information should be online. So if you are going to debunk, there are some strategies that you could follow to make the debunking better. Um, if you give a correction, accompany it by an alternative explanation. Why is that true instead of something else? And then another thing to do is to arouse suspicion of the source of the people who've been sharing it. You can say, for example, hey, did you know this person has already had their account suspended seven times for spreading false health information? A better thing to do is pre-bunking. Pre-bunking is based on the idea of a vaccine, right? I vaccinate you with something, and then by the time you actually get exposed to a virus or bacteria, you have a defense system. This is the same thing, but for false health information. And it does two things. First of all, you tell people you are going to be influenced. Somebody is going to try to influence your beliefs and your attitudes about something. And then you give them some ammunition, like what can you do to refute it? What are the counter arguments to that false health information? And there's very good evidence that this helps. It partially immunizes people to misinformation, to use that vaccine metaphor again. And in a meta-analysis of 40 studies, it had a Cohen's D effect size of 0 0.43 for all our science data geeks who know what that means, which is a medium effect size and actually really um, good effect size. So, so it, it works, the pre-bunking works. An example is uh, you have uh, new moms who need to um, make a decision on whether their babies will be um, uh, immunized. By the time they come into your office and you're going to stop, talk about you know, can we get these vaccines into your child? That mom already has been immersed by family, friends, online, with all kinds of false health information. You're not going to change much about her beliefs anymore. What happens is if we intervene and we say, we're going to go and talk about childhood vaccination with people who are with moms to be so when they're pregnant that's a better time because at that point they haven't really made up their minds yet and then you can give them these counter arguments and that is more helpful the problem of course is it only works if we can reach people before they're exposed and that is really really hard to do the nice thing about pre-bunking is you can generalize it. You can give people strategies of how to recognize when there's an attack on their attitude and how to counter argue against it. There have been some games that are developed that you can have people play like bad news and go viral. But we have a role as advocates on social media to pre-bunk a lot of information. This is an example of a recent tweet by Thinking Powers. And it sort of tells people, here are strategies by which you can tell if something might be false health information. For example, it can be proven wrong, or it just focuses on anecdotes or cherry picks evidence, etc. So this is a good way to share with people some pre-bunking strategies. Now, I really would like for all of you to get involved in social media and help the fight. First of all, the amount of false health information out there completely outweighs by magnitudes that are incredible um, correct health information. So we just need more people to share. If all of us are online, everybody in healthcare profession is online, shares just one fact every month, we will easily you know, turn that around. But it means all of us have to be involved. Of course, we talked about pre-bunking, so that's really important to do and talk about on social media. 
But what happens if somebody shares false information with you and wants to discuss that with you? So do you debunk that? The really important thing for you to figure out is whether this is a, somebody who's just a science denier or somebody who's just truly confused and wants some guidance from you. If somebody is confused, share with them what the scientific consensus is. Don't get too deep in the weeds about the myths that they've heard and why they're wrong, because the problem is at the end, when they walk away from you, they might only remember what the myth was, not why it's wrong. So avoid, and also avoid just dumping knowledge on them. So gently sort of tell them, this is what the evidence is. We're very certain about this, et cetera. When you interact with a science denier, that can get really ugly. You can easily be overwhelmed with thousands of posts very quickly from people calling you a Nazi to a child molester and all kinds of things. Um, being there done that. So it's really a, a waste of your time to try to debate these people. They're not there to debate with you. They apply a technique that's called sea lioning. And they'll just keep throwing things at you to come up with data, to come up with you know, refuting ridiculous things. And eventually you'll just get so frustrated with you that you write an angry response. And guess what? At that point, they have won the debate, not you. So it's better to just disengage from them. And the only thing you do with them is just keep stating the science is, is clear on this. It's good to learn from some of the experts. Here I have two examples of people who are really good at pre-bunking um, and debunking information online. Dr. Timothy Caulfield is in Canada and he's written books about it. He's done TV shows, he's really active on social media. And I'll show you one example of a very recent tweet that he put out that is a debunking tweet. So he's saying, hey, all these conspiracy theorists either will tell us health people in healthcare that we are just sheeple, we don't know anything, we're not really good at anything, anything, but we're also evil geniuses who implant 5G in your arm to follow you. You can't have both at the same time, so you know that, that this is false. So that's a good example of how to tell people to, to think critically about the information they see online. If I do convince you to be online, and I hope I do, um, please make sure that you know where your audience is. So, for example, if you want to um, reach teens and change uh, their health beliefs or talk to them about their health, you probably need to be on Instagram and TikTok. Me they don't want to be on Facebook because the parents are on Facebook. So, for example, I'm on Facebook because I tend to focus more on parents. I welcome you to um, follow me and interact with me and join my fight. I am very active on Twitter and Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn, but really not doing much there right now. That's a goal for another time. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Van Tilburg and also Dr. Chan for a couple of excellent talks. I know we are uh, late in the hour, but and looks like we don't have any questions yet. But if you do have any questions, just throw them in the Q&A. Even if we can't get to them, um, the questions and the answers will be posted on Doc Matters. Um, I do have a billion questions for um, both the speakers and our panel, but maybe I'll just start with one kind of simple one. I think for people who aren't really involved in social media already, thinking about all those things, like all the techniques and the, the strategies, uh, especially with combating uh, misinformation, disinformation, false health, health information can be kind of intimidating. You know, all of us are busy professionals. I think a lot of us feel like we're already struggling just to get through our, like our current workload. Um, how do you guys make time and how much time do you think it really takes to be part of social media and uh, to, to kind of do the things that we talked about today. Uh, how about Dr. Chan, you wanna start? Yeah, I think that's always um, one of the hurdles for, for a lot of professionals starting on social media. And what I would say is that um, I know there are a lot of goals we wanna accomplish, a lot of big goals, combating misinformation, we, but you don't have to start with that. Start with something 
uh, achievable. Uh, I usually tell people to get on social media, at least start interacting, start looking at what people tweet about, maybe do a reply, maybe do a like and retweet. Once, you know, as you get more comfortable and you see what people are posting, then you can get more engaged. And um, I, I, you know, there are people who can engage in social media in different ways. Some people post every day, some people post every few hours. Um, I post maybe every few days, um, especially in the start, you don't have to like limit yourself to a specific schedule. Just do what you're comfortable with and get, get into it. I think very soon you will see that it, it, you, you will build it into your, your kind of uh, routine, like checking emails, like checking text message that becomes part of it, then it'll be more, it'll be easier to get used to using it. Dr. Van Tilder, what do you think? I agree with that. Start with small, um, start with being an observer, like Dr. Chen said, you know, learn from others online, learn what the role is that you want to play online. For me, the only way I can be active is I started sharing things online because I was reading so many articles on parenting and child health. And since I was reading those anyway, for my professional, you know, my what I need to do for my profession, I just started sharing them. Just a quick share, and it wasn't actually all that much work to start sharing them. So, um, so, so try to tie it in with something you're already doing, you know. And now for me, it's an in between. Oh, I'm changing from one task to another. And I need just a little break. I often just look at my social media for my little break. Um, sounds strange, but it works for me. But do what works for you, right? It just 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 build it up slow. Don't think you need to have this big presence right away. Just hang out and see what others are doing. Who you like to mimic? Um, certainly, don't want to tell you to mimic me. You know, mimic nobody. But but see sort of what what kind of role you want to um, play how you can use it and, and use certain tools. So for example, lots of healthcare providers are on Twitter. It's a great way to connect with other people in the field. And um, you can use TweetDex and TweetDex is free and you can schedule your posts. And so if I post for professional accounts, such as for example, the Rome Psychogastrology um, Committee, which I lead with some others, um, I use TweetDeck and I look for posts once a week and I, for information, and then I put it in tweet, I could tweet, you schedule them and they come out and that makes it much easier for me. Yeah. So I guess for people who are new, it's like, don't feel the pressure to start posting, you know, 5 billion times a day and to, to build up this huge presence. You can kind of take it slow and adapt it to what your goals are. Uh, Dr. Webster, anything you want to add? No, I think um, I'm sort of in the beginning stages. So I think what you guys said was really helpful, sort of like following lots of people, starting to see the flow of things and retweet a little bit. You, you know, like I can feel myself building and um, finding more people who are similar. And I think seeing all the different, you know, community up there, like following is, is a good start. There is a question in the Q&A if we have a minute to answer. That sound okay? I know it's late. Okay. Um, Christina asked, what are the best time saving tips for having a presence on social media and maintaining your sanity? So probably similar, but a little bit of a twist on our last question. I, I think, you know, very similar to what, what we mentioned is, is, is sort of, you know, how, how you uh, build it into your schedule and not have your schedule fit into some sort of social media schedule. Uh, I think that's it. That's important. I think the other thing in terms of maintaining your sanity too, and I think we alluded to about when you go on social media, you see people posting a lot of different things. They're doing a million things, it seems like every day and publishing a bunch of papers, going to media. Uh, remember, you know, people usually show their best side on social media. And I think there have been a lot of studies that have shown that. And actually that places a lot of stress on people sometimes being on social media because you feel the need to match up to other people. That's one thing you should try to avoid to keep your sanity. Don't feel like you need to, because someone's posting so much, you have to post all those things. It's not a competition. Don't try to compare with other people, go at your own pace. Um, I think that's, that's the most important thing. And I want to add my first couple of posts. I was happy if I got a like, <laughs> you know, like it, it's hard in the beginning. It's hard to get followers. 
it's hard to get people to reach your posts. Um, start interacting a lot with people. For, I have so many people I follow and who are following me. Um, you really get to know me by tagging me and responding to things to me. And then I'll go like, oh, wait, yeah, now I remember, you know, Dr. Webster does this and this. Maybe I can tag her next time. And, you know, all of a sudden you're in my routine of people to start tagging. So um, take it slow. We, we all, it, it's, it's in, it feels incredibly slow in the beginning, but just be a person who learns from other people um you know be just watch <laughs> you know for a couple of months to see what's out there like some things i think dr chan did a really good job sort of telling you the progression of how you build that on social media and everybody is on their own sort of growth curve and where they are i actually am not you know posting a lot about gi specifically because mine is more wider on child health and so i'm sort of left out on a lot of the you know the gi kind of tweets and you know um ibd monday nights and whatever i'm i'm happy to be they'll be happy to have me involved but they don't naturally think of me and that's okay because that's how i've branded myself so a lot of it is about finding out who you are online what you like to do and where you like to be um so i think in the beginning just being a passive observer is totally a-okay and then saying huh i really like how that person is doing things let me see if that works for me with my voice and honestly it takes some time to get to learn how to write tweets that generate responses because it it's just a different way than we write in academia and you yeah so failure is a good thing it happens to all of us it happened definitely to me <laughs> you know? and in the beginning I was really upset why Emeron you know why some of the people I know very well wouldn't be following me back and then now I've realized well yeah they had over 10,000 followers they had no clue I was even one of their small little people out there who were following them so so take it slow and and build it and use tweet decks and those kind of things that really help you there's all kind of strategies to help you with that yeah yeah, I just want to <clears throat> echo TweetDeck, especially if you're trying to generate content on a schedule, it's so much easier to write all your content and then space it out over time, rather than remembering a certain time of day, I have to tweet this or post that. So, um, okay, so now the questions are coming. I know we're running over, so maybe just like a couple more. I think this next one we could probably do kind of like a rapid fire. So do you all have separate private and professional accounts? So um, I'll just start. So yes, I have separate private and professional accounts. Um, Dr. Chan, what about you? I, I do too. Uh, uh, it, 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 you can avoid uh, errors and problems by having separate ones, I think. Yeah. Same for me. Not yet, but apparently I need to. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't take away that sometimes it's just fun to share something personal about yourself. So, you know, when like my son one time did something really amazing and I just told people about it. Um, that's fun, it shows a human side to you, so yeah. The next question um, is a little loaded and potentially a little bit targeted at me, um, but there, the question is any thoughts on or experience with how social media is used by patients, particularly those with complex motility conditions in positive and negative ways? And I think, um, one of my experiences in a patient that and who asked the question about has been a little bit negative and how they've really um, had a lot of secondary gain from some of the presence they've made on social media, TikTok in this case, and certainly like no motivation to improve their functional GI disorder because a lot of their followers like them because of them being ill. So I'm also curious about experiences and thoughts on how social media could potentially increase the need for followers and likes from some of our patients with functional disorders. I, I think, um, you know, some of the experience I had actually mostly had been somewhat positive because, you know, a lot of things sometimes I post about, um, you know, newest research, um, especially in neurogastroenterology. Um, I think um, a lot of times things that we don't have time to explain 
or um, in clinic, especially the concept of neurogastroenterology brain gut disorders. Um, I think by posting them and putting them on social media and for, that, for the patients to read them on social media, sometimes they come back in the next visit and say, oh, I saw that you posted that paper on, you know, and they, they find things that might be applicable to them. But I think the one thing just to be careful about is that you know that a lot of times patients might be following you. Be very careful about what you put on there. A lot of times people get kind of comfortable with social media or with Twitter. Uh, they're interacting with a lot of their peers. Remember that you know you are not in the in in your workroom or the doctor's lounge. Whatever your 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 chatter is, it's out for everyone to see. So be careful about things you talk about, patients, the wording that you use. Sometimes it's easy for us. It's not, we don't mean for it to be offensive, but some of the wording that we use in describing patient care or stress uh, may come off as offensive to patients. So just be very careful about that. And just a quick note. So one thing, I mean, I feel like you know, Dr. Webster talked about you know the patients who have their own conversations on social media. And I feel like it's a whole aspect that we haven't talked about because, I mean, I think we're all probably seeing more and more patients who say, oh yeah, on this Facebook group, I heard about this or on TikTok, I heard that uh, I definitely have malls or something like that, you know? And I feel like that's going to play a bigger and bigger role in our own day-to-day -day lives. And, uh, you know, sometimes positive, sometimes people will say, oh, I heard you do this treatment and I, you know, wanted to come see you, but sometimes also negative too, especially if they're also getting a lot of, you know, I guess secondary gain from their presence on social media. Um, okay, so I know we're way over. Let's just uh, let's do one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Okay, so um, any thoughts about how to effectively advocate for an institution or department to be more active on social media? So Dr. Chan, I know you're, you know, um, a director of the Motility, uh, Motility Center there. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that it, it, is, it used to be a tough sell. When we started our division account a few years ago, Austin and I uh, worked on that. It took about two years for the hospital to approve for us to use it. Um, but I think using some of the data that we're showing, especially associated with misinformation, with ranking, with reputation, I think there is more and more buy-in from department and institution. I think the, 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 the tough part is having someone who's good at it running it. Uh, we end up running it ourselves. I know a lot of departments have specific people to do it. I think that the, the, the best will be to be a hybrid of both because a lot of times administrative people might not know enough of the clinical side to know exactly what's appropriate to post or not or responding, but having a collaborative um, uh, kind of working relationship, it will be probably the best way. But I think really the best way to, 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 to convince the institution is to use data. Like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. some of the papers, there are a lot of other papers out there similar to ours that shows a correlation between social media engagement and reputation, which hopefully institution will recognize it as good, you know, a, a good um, a, a, a reputation building tool and for revenues and everything too. Dr. Van Tilburg, so you mentioned, you know, you run the accounts for some organizations. Um, what do you think? So I had not had to convince those. To... <laughs> yeah, right. they, they usually come to me, although I did play a little bit of a role in getting AMS online, but they, that, I, they were sold on it very quickly. So I never had this fight. I do have um, in, in my own institute, which is a small private institute, um, it is a hard sell not so much to have a divisional account which we have but to um you know sort of say hey can we change some things on there can we run it ourselves can we you know add some information it all needs to go through a central person and then it often gets it, it's too late it's change the message has changed and it's really difficult sometimes and one of the things i do is just throw constantly I'll remind them of my reach and I'll say, I bet my Twitter account has a bigger reach than your whole media com you know, um, group combined for the university. And that, I just keep throwing that at them that eventually, um, you know, hopefully that sticks. And right now they're, they're after doing that for about three or four years, they finally started to recognize that it might be really cool to have somebody who is, has that kind of reach, but that's the first step. It takes a long time. 
sometimes and they're really concerned about what goes out and honestly for me i know there's been a lot about you know be careful for what you share i have a very strong voice online because i have very strong voice for not just children i feel i need to have a strong voice for but also for women women in medicine um and increasingly for minorities and i just say it as it is and i hear from my institution sometimes like wow you are very strong in your voice and i said oh yes i am <laughs> you know? and they haven't told me to stop yet so it it's all about sort of a balance where you are and i feel like sometimes i need to maybe scream a little bit louder for the people who are otherwise not heard so you know find your balance in that one thing I can add is like if you want to do it for your division or institution, um, there are a lot of you know trainees, fellows, residents that are very motivated, they're very interested, get them involved. Maybe, you know, for us, we start a little committee on social media that we all kind of work on together so we can share on, you know, the, the, the different workload of operating the account. And oftentimes, you know, the fellows or trainees get a lot out of it too. So that might be one way to increase the activity and presence. Awesome. This was really excellent and thank you everybody for participating and adding in some questions at the end and sticking with us the extra 15 minutes. Um, we will make sure to answer all the questions on Doc Matter. Um, and I think this was a really interesting talk, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Thank you for the opportunity.